Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get go ahead and get started. My name is Jake Kilroy. I'm the chair chairman of the board of trustees for Lakeview Academy. Uh, on the call tonight, we of the COVID task force that was assembled early last year at the onset of this pandemic. We also have the four members of the subcommittee, which are medical pressure that are a member of, of the larger COVID task force. And then we have several members of administration. Collectively, I'll refer to all those people as the panelists. And those are the people that, that will be walking you through data that was looked at, reached something we did. Also, that this will be the, the, the vast majority of these people will be the group that will be evaluating the information in the coming days um, with any sort of decision changes. So when we get to the Q&A section at the end, um, you'll be able to ask any of us uh, some questions and Kirsty will walk you through how that it, how, how we do that logistically. One thing I want to say before I turn it over to Kirsty is uh, the, the, the board of trade and the entire Lakeview community has largely been guided by one singular mandate. And that mandate is to keep school open as long as possible so that we can educate our children in the classroom. We found that to be a much more productive place for them to learn. It's a much better place mentally for them to learn. And so our goal last year, and we obviously executed very, very well last year in this regard, and our goal this year is to have as many of the students at Lakeview Academy in the classroom every single day as possible. Obviously, their safety and health is a secondary or derivative aspect of that. But number one is to keep school open so that we can educate your children in the school setting. Um, so recognize that all of the, the deliberations that we've been making are to further that goal. And one other thing I just wanted to add, just, you know, as a parent of two kids at Lakeview, um, we want school to be back to normal. To hear that loud and clear, we would, we, uh, two weeks ago, we were going with mask optional and I have what resembled a more normal year, but to go that there was 15 all call health systems and that's escalated to, to near, and a lot of you have seen some of the articles in the local paper about what the hospital's models are predicting about the next 30 to 45 days. So the analogy that the board has been using internally is very similar or analogous to a tornado. If we, if the weather service called us and told us that there was a tornado heading our way, um, we would immediately ring the alarm and take all the students down to a safe area and ride out the storm. And many ways, that's how this collective group of individuation we want the kids to be safe and out of harm's way, and we want the school to be able to survive this, this episode. So with that, I just wanted everyone to understand that uh, from, a, from a, a mindset perspective, we want to get back to normal as soon as possible, but we're not going to do that until we get enough signal. And we'll talk more about what those may be. I could do that until we get enough signals to where we feel that the storm has passed. So with Okay, I'm. Hopefully, you can all hear me. I think there, there was a, a little bit of breaking up, uh, Jay, on some of the stuff you were saying. But hope, hopefully, you can hear me loud and clear. Um, let me just uh, before we start. Actually, for those of you who weren't on the last call, I just wanted to explain a little bit about the uh, the format and welcome all of you to this uh, task force town hall meeting. Uh, this is the third or fourth. Uh, such meeting that we've held in this format um, in the last year and uh, we seem to be growing with popularity which is uh, always always good news. Um, so the format will be that uh, we uh, I've got a, a short presentation uh, that I want to share with you just to give you a little bit of background on the task force some of the things that we do so you're kind of aware of the activities of the task force um, and now I'm going to hand it over to uh, my medical colleagues on the task force to share um, share the, the latest data with you. And after that, at the end, uh, we will have a Q&A session. And the way that that's done in this format is there is a Q&A uh, box, uh, should be on the panel at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom controls, uh, may be at the top, depending on the device you're using. And you can type those questions into the Q&A and uh, I, I, we will read them out and we will answer them. And obviously in the interest of time, um, if we get to a stage where we, we simply have too many questions, we cannot answer them, then I will 
Uh, I will take all the questions left over, print them off, and we will post uh, written responses to those questions on the website. So if your, your question isn't answered in the time tonight, we will be sure to share that with the community uh, within uh, the next two to three days. So with that said, I just, just want to uh, share a couple of things with you. Um, so again, going back, those of you who were not on previous uh, town hall meetings that we've held uh, last year, we put together a task force made up of a mixture of administration, former head of school, uh, Farrell Singleton, um, and uh, Scarlett Pendarvis, the school nurse, uh, members of the board and former uh, board chairs to really examine how we could best put together um, a plan for uh, safely opening the school. And so in terms of what, what we have been uh, doing uh, for the last uh, year, 18 months or so, um, obviously we, uh, in the last few months, we've been concentrating on creating a back to school plan that is flexible enough to take us through uh, the coming year, bearing in mind that we know that we may hit some turbulence along the way. Um, in addition to that, we, um, as a task force, uh, we certainly create, uh, communicate daily, um, at the moment daily, certainly uh, weekly. And I say task force, but this extends greater than that. There's a reason that the, uh, the Board of Trustees are on this call as well, because um, they certainly are kept apprised of uh, the activities of the task force. And in the case of the, uh, the, the recent decision to acquire face masks, they were part of that discussion and ultimately uh, part of the, uh, the vote to uh, decide that that was something that we would go ahead with as a community. Um, other things that the task force has done is to constantly look at the learning and operations of the school to review and revise any of our policies. So they're not, they're working documents and we keep looking at them all the time to make sure that we are doing the best thing we can for the community. Um, and also obviously planning from last year, planning for the next school year. So just, just briefly, as, as uh, Jay alluded to, our efforts last year did pay off. And, um, you, you know, we, we are in a, a, a difficult time uh, for all of us. Um, and it's not been easy for the community. But when we came together last year um, it, and worked together, uh, we, we were able to see positive results. The positive result is that we lost zero instructional days for the year. And um, so, so really, as, as was said at the beginning, that's really the goal for us is, is to keep the school open for in-person learning. We recognize that that is the best possible environment for the children to learn. And also simultaneously, obviously, um, care for the health and safety of our youngest uh, members of the community. So in brief, uh, what that meant last year is that really we were able to achieve an enormous amount and to try and keep the, the school year as normal as possible, despite the fact that there were so many challenges that lay ahead. And that was done in a combination of, um, of support and a, and a partnership between uh, the family, students, faculty, staff, um, and the administration. And, and I think we're all very proud of what we were able to do um, albeit that it wasn't uh, uh, quite the normal year that uh, we would have liked, but there was an awful lot. Um, again, that's, that's a, a kind of an abbreviated list because then the slide gets too small and no one can read it, but we really, really did achieve great things last year. And, and my, uh, my, my goal is to carry on with that this year, to make all these things and more possible as we go through the coming school year. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues, um, Mo Devay and Jennifer Gotsman. And um, if, if one or the other of you wants to just tell me to advance the slides uh, when you're ready, and I can, I can go ahead and do that. Sure. Thank you, um, Christy, for you and um, everyone for the work the entire community is doing. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Mohawk Devay. I go by Mo. It's easier for people. Um, I'm an emergency physician here at Northeast Georgia Medical Center, and I also serve on the COVID task force um, for the Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Um, been doing that, unfortunately, in that role for, you know, almost 18 months now. 
Um, but more importantly, uh, I'm also a father. Um, I have uh, two children, I, I had two children at Lakeview in the upper school. Uh, one is now at college and one is a high schooler. Um, and just like all of you, I've had to have difficult conversations with them about what we're doing uh, to keep them safe, to keep their teachers and their faculty, their coaches safe, um, and, and had uh, tried to share the information with them. Um, it's not lost on anyone on any one of us on the impact that these decisions that we have have on the students, not only their physical health, but also their mental health. Um, I can tell you just personally, when I had to share this information with my son and that we were gonna go um, to masks uh, and why we do that, I was met with bruh. I mean, that was like, are you, you're kidding me. And, um, you know, that's, I have to have those same discussions, um, you know, and wouldn't ask anyone else to do things that we wouldn't wanna do ourselves. It's also still very hard. I mean, I had a very social, um, senior in high school last year when at a time of these restrictions and trying to get those trying to get them to understand why we're doing some of these things and how it's not always absolute and you know whether it's 14 minutes or 15 minutes or 16 minutes of time you know that can sometimes guide decisions it, it does get confusing um, so for all of us this has been a work in progress um, but really what I want to show you guys tonight is the, our rationale as to why we're making the decisions that we felt that we needed to make to promote the overall health and safety of the students our goals, as you've heard already, were to keep the school open. Um, we all know that in-person learning is the best way um, for our kids to learn academically and socially. Um, we wanted to use local, national, um, and regional data for our decisions. Not always were we following exactly to the letter what the CD says or what um, DPH says. We were using those as our, um, our, as our guidelines, but we wanted to make the best solution for Lakeview community, for the Lakeview community and the school. And we had to adapt. Um, that's one thing that we've had to do here at Northeast Georgia is we've had to adapt. We've we've seen what looks like a Six Flags roller coaster of peaks and waves of this uh, of this pandemic. Um, and we wanted to create a balanced approach. So was, this isn't just looking at COVID, but how are we going to promote the overall students' um, safety um, as well as the staff physical and mental health? So Christy, you can go to the next slide. Um, I think it's important that you understand that our decisions are made primarily on data, but again, recognizing the, the, the health and safety of the children and a balanced approach to also look at their mental health. Um, this graph here is just for Northeast Georgia Medical Center, Gainesville. Um, this is pulled straight from our electronic med medical record. These are visits to the emergency department and also inpatient or transfers out with, a, with, with people that have a diagnosis of COVID-19. Any other diagnosis, any other age group, you're not counted. So you can look at the far left, at the bottom is March 2020 when our shutdown occurred um, and we went to completely virtual. And then you can follow over time where we were throughout the course of this pandemic, particularly pay attention to January 2021, which is when we had the highest volume of cases. And that's also when Kirsty pointed out in her last slides, the days that we had to go virtual. Um, then we fortunately thought, we all felt we were towards the end of this um, as we got towards you know, May and summer and even 4th of July weekend. I remember me personally, I was, you know, our tents were long put away at the hospital and we were excited that, you know, unless we're, for me, I still had to wear a mask in the hospital, but my kids didn't have to use it unless they were traveling or going somewhere else. We thought, we thought the worst was past us. And um, I want you guys to pay attention to the red, uh, which is what's gonna be the next slide, which is this, the peak in cases or this rapid acceleration in cases that we've seen really over the last four weeks. So we're going to basically, with greater specificity, get to the next slide, which shows that time. So that oval that you saw on the last slide is now um, here. I don't know how well that shows, but um, basically these are weeks. Each, each of those columns are weeks. And this is the timeline of where we were as a task force um, as far as making decisions. July 6th, so you know, just it seems like an eternity ago, um, but it really was only just a few weeks ago. Um, we had discussed internally amongst the task force that we were going to have mask optional. That's what the guidance was at the time. There really wasn't any basis for us to feel that we need to be more conservative than that. Um, July 17th, um, the American Academy of Pediatri Pediatricians came out with a statement um, that they recommended universal masking irrespective of vaccination status. Um, we, we recognize that that was their position statement. Um, our, our task force met three days later 
and still felt that even though that was a single specialty recommendation, given the case load that we were seeing um, here, um, we were going to continue with a mask optional um, strategy. Around the same time, you know, as an emergency physician, we're starting to see a bubbling up of cases um, around the 4th of July. And of course, that number just continued to incrementally um, grow. Um, in July 27th, just a week later, the CDC issued universal mask guidance. And then, of course, we saw the, the parabolic increase in cases among children um, in our community, as well as across the state and the country. And we presented that data to the um, board uh, at Lakeview, and there was unanimous approval August 8th um, for the mask guidelines. Um, Chris, if you can go back to the last slide, um, if it makes any difference, when the board made the decision to vote unanimously, that was the that was a, that was a week prior. This is this data was pulled yesterday, um, so they made that decision on that second, basically that second to last um, column. And you can see the numbers have only gone higher since then, with really no um, no. I haven't seen anything to make us think that we're gonna we're 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 gonna mitigate that um, anytime soon based on what's happening um, in the community and in the state. So that's that's the background is that you know we want to make it very very clear you can go back christy to the timeline was that we as a task force were on board with a mask optional strategy for the student body um is as late as july 20th so not even a full what's today the sixth not even a full month ago um but to use the analogy of of a of an incoming storm um or tornado we've had to make adjustments and that's where we are today um, the next slide, basically, is, the, the next pieces are all just data. W what we do know with COVID uh, this time around is that, you know, compared to a year ago, we, we didn't have a vaccine then. Um, we didn't know as much about how to treat COVID as we do now, but we still live in an area of the country where there's still low vaccination rates and our community is lower than Georgia average um, in terms of vaccination. And our students who are in this oval here have most of them don't have access to the to the vaccine because they're not eligible yet. So we really felt we have even heightened pressure now to protect our most um, valuable assets, which are our students. And as we're seeing right now with the Delta strain, it is attacking people that are unvaccinated. That the people that are vaccinated may still have some breakthrough infections, not nearly to the severity that we're seeing in unvaccinated. Um, adults and children, and obviously um, a, a vast majority of our student population um, is unvaccinated. This graph just shows over time, um, the maroon um, is the most recent week of cases in Georgia by age. Um, I put a red line on this graph to show where we were mask optional. And then in the red, when we got to the blue and the maroon weeks, we knew that we had to do uh, take some mitigation measures um, for preventing spread within the Lakeview community. Um, I don't know if Dr. Gossman wants to comment on these because um, she's seeing this in her office. I don't know if she's there. You're muted, Jennifer. I thought I was unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Um, so Throughout the Southeast, you've heard reports, and we certainly, um, as pediatricians, are hearing reports from states that are probably two to three weeks ahead of us in the surge. Arkansas, Louisiana, and Alabama are all, and Florida, uh, and Texas actually, are about two to three, three weeks ahead as far as their Delta cases, as far as looking at trajectory. But even looking at, and you can kind of see these are, this is Georgia to date and that will only continue to grow are the predictions. But looking at, you can see if those date reported on the bottom of that first graph and number of cases that we've really seen exponential increase in cases in kids. Um, you know, the Delta variant is more contagious than the Alpha variant. There are reports from those ICUs in other states that they are, again, they're two to three weeks ahead in, um, they're two to three, three weeks ahead of us, but they are actually have had double the cases in their ICUs um, than they had seen back in January. They're seeing more kids with respiratory symptoms, um, which is um, 
and more severe respiratory symptoms, their ICUs have doubled their caseload. So the second graph is emergency room visits. And again, you can see just like most other graph where the date reported and it, that date is ongoing as we approach where we're looking now, where you can see again, that increase that really represents, I mean, we, we did meet at the 20th of July and we were like mass optional. We felt like that was given local data, something we were comfortable with. Um, I went on vacation with my family for a week, came back, back and the cases had quadrupled in a two week time period. Um, and we made the decisions based on, again, kind of case rates, keeping our patients, not only um, the kind of our less than 12 year olds aren't, are not eligible for vaccination. So it is interesting that Friday, August 13th, Georgia reported that their seven day average of new COVID cases among chil children 17 or younger um, was at an all time high, which means it's worse than it was back in January. And the rate of hospitalization has been higher in other states. Currently, children's health care is seeing record numbers in their urgent cares and their emergency rooms. Actually, one of my partners talked to them today, and we got an emergent message from them last Thursday saying they're having increased wait times. Um, they're seeing a lot of it superimposed on the COVID is also RSV, which has affected um, hospitalization, particularly a young, amongst younger children. So their capacity is less. Um, they had several days last week that they were, their PICU was full. They had some availability the end of the week, but they are running um, really tight on beds, oftentimes as reported by multiple ones of their subspecialists when we have talked to their ICU docs. So um, that's kind of the kind of child data to date. So it's a 1200% increase in cases in kids in 30 days. And I think most data for adults was like a what was it, a 1,049% increase in cases in adults in the last month as well. So this next slide um, is just uh, the Northeast Georgia Medical Center um, projections. This is shared on the incident command call daily. Um, our current modeling uh, is projected to exceed uh, the peak that we saw in January of 2021, uh, which is why we've deployed tents back at the Gainesville and Brazelton campus. Um, we've hired uh, uh, additional staff um, across the system for different areas. We've, we've received uh, additional resources from the state. Um, the modeling that we had for the other three peaks, um, we're using the exact same models, and those, those were actually accurate to the almost a letter of about four to five calendar days off of the peak. Um, this peak on, uh, on four is expected to go, uh, is to occur uh, just after Labor Day. Um, we don't know if the accelerated um, vaccination rate um, in our area um, will help to bend that. Um, you know, there are lots of schools that are having to close now um, due to high numbers of cases. Uh, and uh, we don't know if that's gonna have, what impact that's gonna have, if that's gonna increase or decrease this, but all the modeling that we have seen um, and the models that we saw for last summer when we had that peak in July um, that is that we will exceed our current projections um, in terms of uh, COVID. Um, I think the, the next- Mo, Mo, before you go any further, can we just go back? There was a couple of questions about, uh, the, I think this slide here. Um, and it was to do with the the x y axis. I realise these are di these are difficult slides to um, to read. Pat, we, would you be able to go yeah, through the them y, again? The y, the y axis is uh, the number of actual cases, and the x axis is time. So basically, as you go by, by week, um, it starts in March of 2020 um, and goes by week um, and shows um, and, and just goes um, over time. So the, so the question in the chat is, so the, the high goes from naught, basically naught to 20, pretty much. Correct. For that okay. week. For that week. There are transfers. transfers. That's not right. just cases seen in the ER, correct? Well, that's all. Um, that's mm -hmm. the ER, ER patients. But again, mm -hmm. that just shows a severe, you know, a year ago, COVID was, um, in children was, I can't taste anything or, you know, um, mm -hmm. I can't smell. Um, 
that's not the presentation that we're seeing now. We're seeing high fever. I mean, the same things that Dr. Gossman mm -hmm. did in the office. Um, mm -hmm. greater severity. Mo, Mo, I think one point of clarification, I'm looking at some of the questions coming through. Each of those blue bars represents a, a separate week. So in other words, if you have a week with 20, a week with 15, and then a week with eight, uh, those three weeks would aggregate up to 43 separate hospitalizations over those three weeks. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah it's aggregate. Yeah. And, are, and one thing to note, someone someone asked uh, just, just now about is that 19 students out of 51,000, just to be clear so people understand, these are hospitalizations. These are not COVID cases. These are the people who actually had to go to the emergency room correct. or be transferred to Correct. Okay. Um, the the next piece here, which I think is really really important, um, and uh, provided us uh, at least some optimism, is that um, per the CDC guidelines of uh, that were on August fifth, is that even if there is uh, an outbreak or or a case within a classroom. If the infected, and I want everyone to pay attention to this, if the infected student and anyone else in the classroom were wearing their mask appropriately, the, the only person who would have to leave the school would be that infected person. And of course, anybody else that was symptomatic, but the exposed student does not need to quarantine. Mm -hmm. So like what we're seeing in other schools um, that are, there's, if there's one positive case, if, if, if children are unmasked in that classroom, that's why they're having to shut those schools down because there was no mitigation um, step uh, for this. So if, our, if we all agree that our goal is to keep the kids in, in the classroom, this is the way to do it when the case volume is as high as it is and there's a high likelihood that other people in the class could have, uh, and it could be a COVID uh, contact. So, you know, again, we felt this was significantly going to increase the likelihood of, of school being in person and not shutting down entire classrooms, which is what we had to uh, discuss doing um, in weeks and months um, prior. Let's pause, uh, Mo, do we have, uh, I'll tell you what, go through another couple of slides and then I want to, we'll start working through some of this Q&A that's coming through. Sure. Um, so I think, uh, you know, how do we get back? I, mean, I think it's obviously the, a very, very important question. And it's something that we, um, as a task force have, have already discussed, um, you know, okay, yes, it makes sense. At least we feel it makes sense as to mm -hmm. why we're making these decisions. Um, if you go back to our timeline, um, you can see, um, that we did have a path to, um, to get back and it was based on the number of cases um, because we we were there just again five four three weeks ago i guess um, yeah our expectation is not we're not saying cases need to be to zero we just with the high level of community transmission now we feel like the most successful way to keep kids in school and avoid you know frequent quarantines in outbreaks within the school and protect those who are most vulnerable and can't be vaccinated is the combination of all that is if we mask then really only the ones who are sick with covid are at home and their classmates are able to carry on class in person which is as we all know um the best way to do class so by far so So, I mean, we and we're looking at this, we've committed to looking at this weekly um, and making a determination um, because this did happen candidly. I mean, this was a, I mean, we changed our decision based on the, the week um, and the number of cases. So we, we commit to looking at this data. Um, you know, we are looking, we, we do know what we saw in other countries in India and in, in the United Kingdom um, where they had this similar parabolic rise, but then had a very rapid mm -hmm in cases and if you know our hope is if we see that if if more of our community gets uh, vaccinated and and that, that does decrease the likelihood of transmission um, and severity of illness um, then we we do have a, a path to get back to um, the sense of normalcy that I think we all thought we were going to have mm -hmm. uh, just a few weeks ago um, um we've got sorry 
Jay, you're probably going to say the same thing. We've got a number of questions coming in and I'd ask actually, uh, now we have an opportunity to pause. If you could put your questions in the Q&A rather than yeah. the chat, because they're actually, when they're coming to the, uh, to the chat, um, we, we can't really kind of monitor them in the same way that we can the Q&A. So, right. um, a, a, cu a couple of things, Kirsty, there's, there's a couple of good questions that uh, hit real quick. Yes, yeah, Scarlett's doing this now. Uh, there was a question about what schools were closing. So Ware, Ware County, which is down near, uh, in the, near Valdosta, is a county that's closed all their schools. Long County also announced today that they're closing all their schools. And for those of you, for those of you who didn't see this, about 4 o'clock this afternoon, um, three schools in Hall County, East Hall, Sugar Hill Elementary, and Sardis Elementary, have all gone to mass mandatory um, just due to the last several days. Because remember, Will Schofield came out on Friday and said that it was going to be continue to be optional. So as you can imagine, not only in our community, but also throughout the state of Georgia, this appears to be very fluid uh, and developing literally by the hour. So uh, one of the things we're trying to do, and Kirstie's doing a good job of this, is circulating all this news to the t task force and the board of trustees. Uh, and that's, this is just information we're going to continue to accumulate as we see not only our peers begin to go to masking, whether it's East Hall High School or, or some of the elementary schools, uh, but also what other counties in the state of Georgia are shutting down completely. Okay, um, I see there's um, an en enormous number of questions, which very, very much appreciate. And, and again, appreciate you all taking the time to join this discussion. We want to, uh, uh, discuss these topics. We want uh, you to feel free to reach out to any of us at any time with your questions. We're always happy to answer them. So I'm going to go down, just do a, a smattering. I'll start just clearing some out of the chat and then we'll go to the Q&A. And as I said, if you could put them in the Q&A, that's much more helpful. Um, okay, so the, the one that came up was, uh, uh, there was one about, let's see, uh, if the case numbers are increasing, are we going to restart home temperature monitoring? Um, and actually, Scarlett, do you want to weigh in on that and give a response? Sure, I answered that one in the chat as well. Um, so we, we're not doing um, an app this year for like a formal attestation for parents to fill out. Um, last year, we, we had an app and, and then also an email system. Um, that, that we collated those answers from each morning. Um, this year we're not doing that, but we did send out uh, in kind of the back to school correspondence. And then also on the website, there is uh, a new graphic and uh, similar to last year's about how uh, to monitor your child, what that looks like, what symptoms to look for. And of course, temperature is a part of that and it gives that temperature guidance there. Um, so we, we ask parents to do that, um, that assessment on, on their own, uh, you know, in our talks with um, the lead, lead nurses in Georgia, uh, had a meeting with the um, deputy department, the deputy director of the department, department of school nursing um, with uh, the Georgia Department of Health uh, about three or four weeks, three weeks ago. Um, and one of the main mitigating factors that uh, the, of the feedback that was given to the Department of Health from school nurses was that it's not sending children to school sick, um, not sending anyone to school with symptoms, not coming to school as an administrator, staff, or faculty uh, with symptoms was um, really a, an, a very good and you know mitigating strategy in and of itself. So yes, please do. Um, at the beginning of this, we were all kind of asked to monitor. Um, temperatures, you know, morning and evening upon awaking and before going to bed. And um, our family did that here. Um, and then we, you know, stopped doing that for a while. And, and then now we're kind of back to it just so that, you know, your own baseline, your child's own baseline. Um, that information is helpful to me also as um, the school nurse for your child. Sometimes they have a, a basal temperature that's, you know, runs a little bit higher, or a little bit lower. So it's good to know that that you, that's really when you can, you know, kind of discern what, what a fever is, uh, is if you have that good baseline. So, so monitoring at home is, is also always a great idea. 
Okay, thank you, Scarlett. Um, all right, let's 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 start with, um, actually the first question that was emailed to me this afternoon, what is your plan to, to manage address the opposing parental viewpoints and opinions regarding wearing masks? Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to respond, Jay, also perhaps you could weigh in on this one. Um, I mean, I, I am, uh, myself and John uh, Simpson have taken many calls this week from, uh, from parents um, with, with different views about um, this issue of the mask requirement. And um, I've responded to um, all parents that have contacted me. John and I have been on the phone. We've, we've uh, spoken to parents outside the school and we're always uh, willing and uh, open to hearing from anybody. We recognize that this is a, a very um, polarizing issue and uh, we're respectful of different opinions. Um, no, no one wants to wear a mask. I don't want to wear a mask. John Simpson doesn't wear, want to wear a mask. And, and we, we really do, um, you know, sincerely uh, understand uh, the, the, the angst that this is causing. But as a, a board of trustees, as an administration and a task force, we, uh, we make decisions collectively about what's best for the Lakeview community, uh, because our, our ultimate responsibility is to the students of Lakeview. And uh, so we will continue to, uh, to listen. And uh, we, uh, there were some, uh, there was a protest outside the school this morning. Uh, people are free to protest. Um, and uh, we will continue doing uh, what we have to do to keep the school uh, safe. Um, just going oh, now to, yeah. sorry, Jay. The things that we've tried to do as a board, there's 21 of us, and we've really gone out of our way to try and populate the board over the last uh, three to five years with a wide variety of constituents to represent the, the whole Lakeview, not just a portion of Lakeview or a, or, you know, a neighborhood or a zip code, et cetera. And I think what everyone on this call needs to hear, because everyone's, everyone's input who's a parent at Lakeview is valuable. But there is lots of different constituencies at Lakeview. You cannot have 560 kids and 350 families and not have differences of opinion. And I can tell you over the last 48 hours, I have asked as chairman of the board to receive every single email Kirsty gets and every piece of feedback she gets regarding this issue. And overwhelmingly, and let me say that again, overwhelmingly, people are in favor of the policies we're pursuing right now and the, the decisions that we've made and why we've made them. So I, I totally understand that not everyone's going to like this. And I, I don't like wearing masks either. But we're doing this based on the 80-20 rule. We're a business. If 80% of parents are concerned about this and they're scared to send their kids there and the data is telling our medical task force that we should do something, we're going to tolerate 10 or 20% complaining because they just don't like it as a, as a general rule because we we'll do surveys slides last year, 95% of people gave us a five out of, or 75% of surveys gave us a five out of five on the handling of the COVID crisis last year. Let me say that again. 75% of surveys gave us a five out of five scoring for last year. And over 95% gave us a satisfactory or above scoring. So either the people that are upset, and I encourage everyone to, to voice their opinions in, in forums in addition to that. If you're not feeling you're not participating, then we can't we need in order to make the sound decisions for the entire community. Um, because oftentimes we'll hear that, well, I, I don't fill out the surveys. Well, that, that doesn't do us any good. The reason we send out the surveys is so that we can get a broad group of feedback on all the different constituents of Lake New Academy. We're running this for all 350 families, not for a handful of families. And I say that completely with compassion and empathy and, and, and trying to be deferential to everyone's different opinions. But we really are managing to not just Gainesville, not just Flowery Branch, not just Brazelton. We're managing to a large area with a lot of different mindsets. So I'd ask for those that are not satisfied with this decision 
to just understand the position that the board is in, in terms of how we have to run the school. Okay, there's, uh, I'm gonna try and get to uh, many of the questions. Um, okay, there's one here with, with masks being required, why are some teachers not enforcing proper wear, the proper wear of masks in their classroom? Both my children reported repeatedly seeing kids wearing masks wrong nose and or over mouth covered, taking them off in the hallways between classes and teachers not enforcing proper wear in the, in the students, um, or even themselves. Halfway approach is no, is as good as no approach. Um, I think this is a comment rather than maybe a question. The administration needs to do a better, uh, have repercussions for these lack of wear and enforcement. I would say to that, I, I can maybe respond to that. Um, certainly, I, I've witnessed it myself. I've witnessed children walking along the corridor with the, the mask, uh, you know, not covering their nose. I've certainly uh, seen uh, children, you know, with masks on upside down. And I would be the first to admit that this is an, certainly an imperfect thing to try and enforce um, the, the mask requirement. Um, we do have a uniform policy. I consider this as part of the uniform policy. And we do have uh, loss of privileges and other ways that we can address um, issues like this. But certainly uh, it's always on my mind. I'm always reminding uh, staff, I'm always reminding faculty, and I'm certainly always reminding students about the importance of proper, uh, the proper wearing of masks. And all of us will continue to do so until the need for the masks is, uh, is no longer necessary. Um, I want to get on to some questions really about the science and I'm hoping that the medical doctors can answer these. Um, question here, one thing that we've seen is there's no consensus on the science around who's at risk, who is not and what to do about it. Um, there are arguments on both sides, even from the CDC and other government agencies, they flip flop. The one consensus is that COVID is going to be here forever. Um, it's a virus just like the flu and common cold. When are you going to make a decision that's something we are going to live with and get back to normal? When will you allow our kids to get back to normal? Perhaps someone... do, you want, do, you, do, you want, do you want the board to answer that, Kirsty? Yeah, the board or, or the medical, okay. uh, perhaps the, the medical doctors can weigh in on the, the difference, uh, the arguments on both sides and the difference consensus on the, on the data. As I've shared. Well, I want to, I want to... Yeah, Mo, can I say one thing and then, I'll, then you can answer? Um, the board is taking recommendations from the medical task force. If at some point the board believes that the medical task force uh, recommendation is not appropriate, the board will make a decision and relay that to Kirsty, and we'll go from there. Obviously, we put a lot of confidence in what the medical professionals are saying. But if we're task force was just as high was sharply and had been cut in half then the board may decide to call an emergency meeting and make a vote to change policy but it's going to be based on facts and circumstances as to what's going on and a lot of us you probably have urls you can link to the covid hospital data and other things like that um, those are the things that we'll be we'll be looking at so i would say you know the other thing is to realize that covid is i mean there are a lot of things about it that are very difficult. It is one, it's unlike a disease, really unlike any disease we've seen in the past. I think it's one of the things that is hard for everyone in that some people look at, you know, some people get COVID and have very mild symptoms, if any, and other people end up in the ICU. And sometimes it makes sense because this person has quote unquote underlying conditions. And sometimes it's the person you least expect who gets sick with it. You know, it is more about how our bodies react to COVID than how, you know, that it's not as predictable as even like the flu or any of those. So, you know, I don't think there is any intent. I certainly, I miss normal. I, I would love to go back to normal. I, I'm in a mask all day, every day. Um, and I miss seeing, you know, my patients' faces. I mean, it's hard on, on everybody. I think that, you know, the CDC has, you know, that it is always evolving data. And that's why we spend time trying to keep up with kind of things as they change. I think, you know, if you'd ask us six weeks ago, like when we made the mask optional thing, it was based on where we were with the alpha variant. When Delta came and became the predominant variant in the United States, the disease process, the contagiousness changed. And the response, in fact, what we're trying to do is maintain as much as normal right now, 
ultimately, I think if you ask anybody in the medical field, they will tell you that the way that we get past, I do think and most of us agree that COVID is probably here to stay. The way we ultimately get past it is you have to reach herd immunity at some point, um, you know, through vaccination and other and having the disease and, you know, somewhere in between. But, you know, by no intent, this Delta, you know, when you look at the hospitalization, and the severe disease, even in children, a more what appears to be a more evolving um, severe disease, it's a balancing act. Um, but we all, you know, certainly as parents, as um, fellow humans, I think we all miss what we used to have. We probably realized we took a lot of stuff for granted. And I think, you know, the goal would be, you know, as soon as these numbers drop, as soon as we get through the surge, when it looks, you know, then we will certainly go back. We try to do as much as we can to keep normal because I think that's so important. I think, you know, speaking, I certainly as a pediatrician, in-person school to me is essential to mental health for children. And if wearing a mask keeps my children in school, you can ask Carter Gotsman, who's an eight-year-old, who hated homeschool, he would wear a hazmat suit if that's what it took for him to be in school and me not be his teacher. Um, so, you know, I think trying to, you know, all work together and realize that, you know, we, we want, we want it to go back to normal. We, you know, I, I don't know. I certainly let Mo say, you know, he sees the adult population. So. I, I would also um, add finally, and then we need to move on to other questions that the school itself and just just the planning that we have, if you look at the uh, ca calendar for the year, we're not changing anything. I mean, we are doing everything as normally as we can. We had convocation today. We've got trip week, albeit a uh, modified trip week because of circumstances really outside of our control. Um, but we're doing everything that we can to keep things normal. Um, athletics is carrying on. Uh, um, fine arts is carrying on, grandparents day, candlelight, all those things you saw listed earlier, we are carrying on with. So as far as possible, where, where so many other schools are, uh, um, are, are kind of canceling things, we are, we recognize the importance of keeping things normal. And I guarantee you, there are numerous creative folks on the staff, on the faculty and administration who are coming up with wonderful ways to, to do a new normal so that we can keep the kids um, in school and, and, and happy. Now move, moving on again, more questions um, for the task force. What evidence do you have that masks are effective? Many medical professionals argue they are not. Well, there are studies and I think you put those in, they're on the website, are they not, Kirsty? Yeah. Uh, but there are studies. So, you know, looking at there were multiple studies done last year with mitigation strategies that were in place, which include social distancing and masking. Those studies were done. The three that I know off, off the top of my head are North Carolina, um, Missouri and Utah, I think. Um, all three of those showed impressive, you know, decrease really low in school transmission. So I think the North Carolina study showed less than 1% in school transmission with mitigation strategies in place. Um, we do not have a whole lot of studies without mitigation strategies in place because most people did something last year, but there is a study in Israel, which is a good com contrast when Israel did, went to basically stopped masking for a period of time in the last year, they found that transmission rates kind of, and this was with the alpha variant, so it's not the delta, which is more transmissible, but with the alpha variant, transmission between students was 12% and between student to faculty was 16% in that school. When that happened, they actually ended up having to close the school for a period of a few weeks and then resumed with mask. But I think those articles, if you'd like to um, look at them are on the website. Yeah, I, po I posted, a, there's a document posted on our website has numerous links to uh, doc uh, research on the efficacy of masks. Okay, another question. Um, what's the information out there about the timeline for the possibility of children younger than 12 to be vaccinated? So currently um, the estimation is probably November. Um, the initial studies, Pfizer is, will be the one that will be um, probably the one that'll be approved first, just as it is the one that is the only one currently approved for 12 to 18 year olds. Um, but the initial studies, the dose is different for a five to 11 year old. 
The initial studies were done about halfway through that study, the FDA asked for increased numbers. So initially it was supposed to be September, but now they think it will be November. And there is some debate as to whether it will be an EUA or whether it will be a full, it will be fully um, accepted, so. Okay, um, if there's a chance of breakthrough in general infections, how do you reconcile close contact sports and extracurriculars? Anyone want to take that one? Uh, <clears throat> the plan right now is to continue contact tracing. Um, both the CDC and the Department of Health have urged us to continue uh, with contact tracing for that reason. So if we have unmitigated close contact, um, we, will be con we will be identifying those um, close contacts and you know, sending information to the parents um, and that will look similar to a quarantine um, situation that have, you know, that maybe your child experienced last year. The only caveat to that would be um, that the guidance as of today still stands that anyone vaccinated would not need to quarantine at home. The quarantine for a vaccinated person would look like uh, once you are deemed a close contact, you would then be asked to put on a mask and monitor your symptoms. You may, re you may stay at school or at work, um, but you would monitor your symptoms. You would, the school nurse and the school systems are charged to actually, um, we, we would know who was on quote school quarantine, meaning that vaccinated person would be in our building with a mask on, regardless of whether we are in or out of our mask requirement in the moment, right? So let's say we're out. You're quarantined, you're vaccinated, you can come to school, but you must wear a mask, you must distance, and you must monitor for symptoms at home. If you become symptomatic, at that point you would be tested um, and could return with a negative test, three days, 72 hours, no symptoms, no fever. Or if you test positive, you would begin an isolation period at that, at that time uh, for, of 10 days. That isolation period's not changed. Um, but what was the other part of the question? So yeah, a lot like last year, which is why the masking helps us so much right now. So during this current surge, um, you know, it was just consensus that what, what, what does everybody want? They want to stay in school. They want to stay in their activities. They want to have their traditions. They want to do, um, you know, the kids need it, that the mental health um, concern is, is all of our concern. Um, that those studies came back that the mental health um, that issues that the, ch the children are, are experiencing um, are not necessarily coming from our mitigation in ways that of distancing, masking, disinfecting, but they're coming from that isolation um, of being removed from school and put and having that home quarantine or having remote school um, and, and not being able to be with peers. And, and teachers for in-person learning. I, I would also just uh, reiterate, there's several questions come in um, in the Q&A um, about, there's, there's questions about what's the argument against wearing a mask, uh, what the mental health issues are being purported. And then the question below says uh, the exact opposite. So, you know, that masks don't uh, prevent viruses from spreading. Um, and so I, I would say we, we, you know, for the sake of time, as it's 7.25 now, and I know we've been, many of us have been on call since six o'clock with the annual meeting, um, we, we did uh, spend some time over the weekend gathering as much uh, research as possible on the use of face masks, on the efficacy of them, on the impact of face masks, uh, the studies that have been done, uh, the impact of wearing them on children, um, and, and the impact of wearing them to prevent the, the spread of COVID. And I, I would refer all of you to those links on our website. Um, the um, Arcan Arkansas Children's Hospital also has some fantastic resources on uh, the use of masks. And again, it's, it's uh, data, um, it's scientific studies uh, and clinical data. Um, and uh, I definitely, 
uh, worth a, a read. I know that there was a, uh, there's a study recently out of uh, uh, Stanford um, uh, or purportedly out of Stanford, which was uh, also about masks. And, and there's a reference to that um, on, our, uh, on our listing as well. Okay, um, just maybe two more questions and then I will, uh, we can answer the rest of the questions. I promise there was a, a comment there about seeing all the questions in Zoom. I will gather them all up and we'll put them in a Word document and make sure they're all available um, on our website. Um, what percentage of students and staff at Lakeview are vaccinated? Is it known? Uh, I think, again, that's one for you, Scarlett. Yeah, so uh, the numbers, uh, the percentages I have are just um, from last May. So it doesn't necessarily, we have not, um, we have not tabulated that data. We haven't uh, asked yet um, for summer vaccinations. I've had some parents um, offer up that information, but uh, as, a, as a school, as a task force, we have, we have not sent, um, you know, that out to, like as a, in a question form, vaccinated or not. As of last May, we had about 75% of faculty and staff um, be vaccinated through our um, vaccine clinic that we held on campus. And then after that, we had several more faculty and staff um, be able to be vaccinated throughout the rest of the spring and a few over the summer. As far as the students, when they rolled, when they, um, when the eligibility age um, was from 16 and up was announced um, immediately. I had Long Street Clinic come um, and they brought they brought vaccine to, on campus, and those students were allowed with um, with consent uh, to come and, and be vaccinated with us, and that was at around 55 percent. However, um, I have received many uh, more emails about kids being vaccinated since that time. It's just that I don't have that hard data as far as like doing a survey. Um, unfortunately, when the uh, eligibility level went to 12 and up, we were in our final days of school and in the throes of uh, final exams. So um, I, you know, discerned that greatly, wanted to do that, but I also got with um, Ms. Darlene Snyder and she and I decided that would not be in the best interest at that moment to um, disrupt the the children's exams, and it would be hard, kind of really difficult to get together that quickly. So what I did instead was um, to reach out to the Department of Health uh, and also to Long Street Clinic since they had the vaccine and, um, and plenty of the Pfizer, which is the only one that the, those kids can have. And I, held, I gave, sent out information school-wide that they helped, we had two uh, dedicated vaccine clinics for just students and their families. So meaning no wait, um, no appointment, just go on these two Tuesdays, uh, it was a Tuesday or Thursday, and during these times. Um, and so they opened that up for our four students and their families specifically, uh, you know, as to, to get that done for the people that wanted it. Again, I've had many more in that group. That group over the summer um, 12 to 15 was uh, killing it on vaccines. They were heads, they were percentage points above the rest of the age groups. The age group lagging the most is actually um, that, like that 35 to 45 kind of age group. Um, and, and they, the 12 and up was the, was the, were the ones getting vaccinated uh, at a high rate. And, and, and the, the belief there was that they were the ones most greatly impacted um, being, having to be sent home. That, that, so that March um, to the following school year when we had to all go home was uh, something that they never wanted to experience again. So, um, it, you know, I think that was the, the push for that was to be able to be back and be in sports um, and, be, and be safe and be able to open our doors, keep them open and, um, and that's what that's eventually what we'll, what this will do. Addressing one other thing quickly, um, someone asked about you know when are we going to realize that this is here to stay. Um, I, I've done a lot of reading on that. Um, it is it is going to move from pandemic to endemic um, at some point, and 
that question of, you know, when are, when are we, I think you're think I think that that's being addressed as we at Lakeview. Well, we at Lakeview uh, can't move to a situation where we can treat this um, as anything other than it, what it is until we can vaccinate, until everyone on our campus has an ability to be vaccinated. Once everyone has the eligibility, once we get the five years on up, and we give people the time to uh, discern for themselves, their families, and to have that. At that point, we we do kind of, we reach that that endemic, if you will, in our community. Um, now that doesn't mean that the whole, you know, the the outside, but but we we reach a point where everybody who's got you know can get it. It that we just can't get it right now. I mean, like you have to understand that. They, we, we ha it's our obligation to take care of the people on campus that are not even eligible. So we, we have to do that. And at some point they will become eligible and then we're going to, we have stepwise things that we do after that. Thank you, Scarlett. Um, okay, so it's now 7.33 and uh, as I say, we've, we've, We've been on the call for an hour. We've also had the previous meeting, the annual meeting, and uh, I, I realise there's there's so many other questions that uh, aren't to answer. Um, I would ask um, again, all of you. My 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 door is open. My email is open. My phone's on. Uh, Mr. Simpson's always happy to speak to people. Members of the board of trustees, the task force. There is a an email that you can reach the task force. Um, which is on our back to school plan. I'm, I'm thinking it's like COVID response at lakeviewacademy.org. Um, I'll, I'll confirm that. Um, we will uh, be sending out our notification. I realized in, in my folly, I wasn't accounting for the fact that people would be traveling and going to church on Sunday. So um, that means that our my original idea of having a 12 noon uh, announcement on a Sunday about the mask requirement will probably be pushed a little bit later. But um, as as I, I can't emphasize enough, this is a, a community effort to keep our, our children safe, our staff and faculty safe, our, our visitors safe, to be responsible and good partners with our local uh, medical facilities and systems so that we, not, we are not part of the problem or adding to the problem. And um, I, I truly believe that this is a little bit of turbulence uh, that we've, we've got to put our seatbelts on for uh, a few weeks, uh, maybe less, and, uh, uh, um, and we will get through it. The seatbelts will come off and we will have a wonderful uh, school year. Sorry, the, the kitten just ran in front of the camera as, as to finish the Zoom call. Okay, I'll leave it there. Any final comments from the, the board or the task force and then we'll wrap it up for the evening. I just appreciate everyone's engagement. Um, well, you know, I, again, I know this was a very difficult um, decision and, and can be controversial. Um, you know, I can tell you we, as, as a physician, um, you know, we practice evidence-based medicine. Um, so whether you come in with a heart attack or how you're treated with COVID and how we protect our students, it's based on data. Every piece of data that we have that is that is acknowledged that we that we look at in the scientific community is pointing to this being the best steps to mitigate, um, you know, the spread of COVID um, in the school systems. If that data changes, just like we've had to make adaptations, we are more than we will. We guarantee we will look at that. We've had to look at how we treat COVID a year ago to compare what it is now. It's sometimes it's it's completely opposite. Um, so we, we look at that. Um, and so if you have information that you'd like the task force to look at, feel free to submit that to us. Um, we want to do again what's best for the entire community. I'll, uh, I'll close with two comments. First, I want to say thank you to Mo, Jennifer, Scarlett, Sheetal, Farrell, RK, and everyone else who's on the COVID task force. They're, they're all volunteers. They're all parents. They have full-time jobs. They've given up a lot of their own time to help us. We got to a tremendous amount of comments throughout this town hall about the uh, basically thank yous from parents and people talking about the efforts and and I'll direct those to the, our medical task force and all the other volunteers. Remember, the entire board of trustees is volunteers as well, all 21 of us, um, and we're doing this because we're parents. So I just want to say thank you to all the board members and all the medical task force members. This is a very and and of course the the, the staff and the faculty administration. It's a very stressful time for everybody. Nobody likes going through this. 
we hope it's over soon. Um, and, and then I'll say one last thing, you know, I, my kids have been at Lake Views uh, for 12 years. And uh, one of the things that we've always loved about Lake View is the family environment and how we've all come together. And I think this is one of those moments where we don't disagree, where we don't always agree on certain things. And that's natural, but we are one Lake View. So when we're at the football games and we're at other things, we can talk. When you see a board member, talk to them about these things. We want to be approachable. We want to have conversations. We want to think about other perspectives. But that being said, we are one Lakeview. And I hope that we'll continue to have the decency and civility that the school has shown throughout all the years about different perspectives and mindsets, because that's what makes the school so special. So with that, I want to thank everybody for the incredibly robust attendance tonight, and particularly to the medical team here for presenting all this data. And Kirsty, one thing I'll add is several people asked if we could circulate these slides tomorrow which I think would be easy to do to, to email these slides to the parents. So thanks to everyone who participated tonight and uh, everybody have a great night's sleep and look forward to day two at Lakeview. Take care. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining.